please welcome from uh, Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, Dr. Stephen Labuti. Yeah, sure. Well, first off, I want to thank uh, Bob, Marianne, and Secan uh, for the invitation uh, to come down from the Bronx, from the, uh, the northernmost borough. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be able to come and talk to you, all of you this morning and many familiar faces in the audience of, uh, of folks I've had the privilege of helping to participate in their care and certainly to be on the program uh, with the rest of the speakers that you're going to be hearing from today um, is uh, quite an honor. And I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Gerstein's talk this morning, which really sets the stage uh, for the rest of us today. And you'll hear uh, some uh, similar uh, themes in my talk. But what I've really been tasked with discussing this morning, and I'll try to move uh, through it uh, fairly briefly, um, is multidisciplinary team approach uh, to managing neuroendocrine tumors. And this is a topic that's very near and dear uh, to my heart. And uh, one can expand this beyond just the management of neuroendocrine tumors and really give a talk on the multidisciplinary team approach to managing patients with cancer. And I came to New York. I'm actually from New York originally, from the south shore of Long Island, Long Beach. Um, but I left in 1995 after training uh, at Columbia Presbyterian uh, to go down to the National Cancer Institute. And I spent 14 years down uh, at the NCI where major focus of my both research and clinical activity was neuroendocrine tumors. But it struck me while I was down there that the way in which we went about treating patients with cancer uh, was very siloed uh, and a very um, uh, stepwise, that is, you saw one physician, and then that physician referred you to another physician, and then that physician referred you to a third physician, and the third physician didn't always know what the first physician had told you, and you were scrambling to get the information from the first physician to the third physician, sometimes back to the second physician, then off to a fourth physician. And the burden was really placed on the patient to navigate through that maze of, of, of uncertainty, sometimes confusion, uh, in terms of piecing together their entire care paradigm. And you would think that the National Cancer Institute, which is the largest of the institutes at the NIH, a budget of over $5 billion a year, uh, really the leading uh, organization in the United States uh, for both uh, cancer research and cancer uh, clinical trials and cancer care, uh, would have their act together in terms of a better mousetrap. Well, the truth was we didn't. I would often have patients travel quite some distance from locations all over the country to see me in my clinic, and my clinic happened to meet on Fridays. And we were very focused on clinical trials, and they'd come all that way to see me. And for one reason or another, they did not meet the eligibility criteria for the study. Eligibility criteria is real important. It's not just a gatekeeper for patients to get into studies, but it tries to match patients with the right therapy to try to maximize their potential for benefit and minimize toxicity. And so we couldn't just put a patient on a trial just because they'd traveled a long distance. But yet, if they didn't meet eligibility criteria, here I was with this patient on a Friday afternoon, having traveled from California to Bethesda, Maryland, with nothing to offer them. And no other specialist there with me for them to talk to to see if there were other things available. And that really bothered me. It bothered me quite a bit. And when the opportunity came for me to come back to New York, to Montefiore and Einstein, I thought there must be a better way to be able to do this. There must be a way to do this where the patient isn't figuring all of this out, but the patient just has to arrive at our door, and then we'll have all the specialists there at the same time in the same place to be able to help navigate the patient through all this confusion, put a plan together for them, and if one specialist doesn't have the right answer, perhaps another one sitting right next to them does, and that patient's trip will at least leave with a plan as opposed to the confusion that they came with. And so therein became the birth of what's now referred to as the Montefiore Einstein Center for Cancer Care in the Bronx, where we are multidisciplinary across all of the various tumor types and disease types. We've sort of knocked down those silos 
that define a surgical oncologist and a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist. And instead of defining ourselves by our disciplines of training, we define ourselves by the types of tumors we're interested in treating and we're passionate about being involved in helping our patients. And so we have teams that are dedicated to specific kinds of cancers, breast cancer teams, colon cancer teams, uh, teams focused on liver cancer, teams focused on lung cancer, and it just so happens a team focused on neuroendocrine tumors. And that was no surprise, given that's the, my interest and had been my passion for the time that I spent at the NCI. And so we stood up what we refer to as our endocrine and neuroendocrine tumor program. And so what I'd like to talk to you very briefly about this morning is what that program's about, how it evolved, and why I think it's an important paradigm for not only treating neuroendocrine tumors, but treating all cancers, and why neuroendocrine tumors are probably the perfect example for the benefit of a multidisciplinary team approach. And so, next slide. So, familiar slide. This just sets the stage for neuroendocrine tumors. Again, you saw this uh, in the previous talk. And I use this slide uh, in, in the context of this talk uh, slightly differently. And so I often put this slide up to say, look, isn't this interesting? Uh, neuroendocrine tumors are increasing in incidence, and we're really not exactly sure why that is, maybe better diagnosis, et cetera. But really, I'm using this slide to say that the estimated incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is one to two per 100,000 population. That's rare. I mean, they are increasing in incidence, but they're still rare tumors. I mean, these tumors are not seen with the frequency of lung adenocarcinomas, or certainly colon adenocarcinomas, or breast cancers. And so it's not unusual that the typical practicing physician is not aware of these tumors other than what they might have heard in medical school. They may go through a decade of practice and not see a patient with this type of tumor. And so when you have a tumor type or any disease type that's rare, bringing a group of practitioners together that has an interest in that tumor type can be of benefit in terms of the exchange of knowledge on, on a rare entity. Now, this is also something that you heard about a bit, and that is the staging of these tumors. And these tumors behave very differently. Staging systems are, by their very nature, used to describe the average or the typical. Even among a population of tumors like neuroendocrine tumors, which are rare and unusual, there's still average presentations or typical presentations. But the interesting thing about cancer in general, and neuroendocrine tumors in particular, is that uh, I like to use the phrase, and this is one that one of my mentors at the NCI used to say all the time, is biology is king. And what that means is that each tumor's biology, which is influenced by the person the tumor is growing in, will dictate how that tumor will behave. And so for some patients with a neuroendocrine tumor, their time course for growth and spread of their disease is very rapid. You know, they may be diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor and within a year or two have metastatic disease and within a year or two have succumbed to that disease. Whereas another patient may be diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor and live with that neuroendocrine tumor for 20 years, 25 years. I have patients that I've treated, and I'm sure the same stories exist around the table in the front, that I've treated with metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, resections of their liver metastases, uh, when Clinton was president, if you want to mark things by the changes in presidential administrations. And so these can be very slow-growing tumors, or they can be very aggressive tumors. And therefore, the ability to distinguish what type of tumor an individual patient has can often be a challenge, despite our best efforts at putting these into stages and generalizations. And while it's true that stage for stage and KI-67 proliferative index, proliferative index changes, we see differences in survival for patients, those with low stage tumors or small tumors or those patients with low KI-67 tumors tend to do better on average than patients with higher KI-67 uh, indices. There are still patients out, you know, 120 months with very high KI-67 proliferative indexes. And why is that? You know, these are some of the 
you know, sort of conundrums or perplexing questions that face us as clinicians and investigators in this field, trying to understand why these markers, while on average can be helpful, for each individual patient may not tell the whole story. And that could be very confusing when you're trying to deal with this as a patient or you're trying to deal with it as a practitioner. That's not to mention the growing number of therapeutic options we have for patients. And as you heard in the previous talk, matching the right therapy and the sequence of therapies to the right patient and their presentation and their biology of their tumor can be very perplexing. The good news is that we have more and more therapies available now. As was mentioned earlier, for years, decades, we had maybe one or two agents in addition to surgery and radiation therapy that we could bring to bear on this problem. But now, it's almost every six months to a year that a new agent is coming into a clinical trial or a new agent is being approved, and that's good news. But it's almost the speed at which that's happening now as we understand the molecular biology better. It creates confusion, both for the patients and the practitioners. I'd be willing to bet, and you may see this later in the, in the question and answer phase, that if you lined up a panel of experts and asked them what's the best sequence of therapy or what's the best markers to follow, you'll likely get four or five different answers. And each of them will be as passionate and convinced about their approach as the next one. But which ones are accurate? Which ones are right? Which ones are the ones to follow? And so one can drive oneself crazy going from place to place to place and person to person to person trying to sort through all of that and figure all of that out. And therefore a paradigm where you bring a group of experts together and put them all in one place as the patients come in may help alleviate some of that confusion and may lead to the crosstalk among disciplines that helps to breed clarity of focus, clarity of recommendation. And so, among our options, surgical resection, as was told, is often the first option and sometimes the best option for solid tumors, but not always. Radiation therapy, systemic therapy, what we call regional strategies. Here's some examples. Surgical management of hepatic neuroendocrine tumor metastases results from a multi-institutional study that was done both in the United States and abroad where benefit to survival was seen from doing aggressive surgical resection of liver metastases from both pancreatic and GI neuroendocrine tumors. Very promising work. But is that appropriate to apply to every patient? Isolated hepatic perfusion, one of the choices of regional therapies, a very uh, intricate and complicated surgical procedure only performed at three or four centers in the United States. This shows significant benefit for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. This is a patient with incredible bulky disease. This is an MRI, the liver, head is going into the board, feet coming out. You can see all these bright tumors on MRI basically taking up the entire liver. A year and a half after a single isolated hepatic perfusion, no evidence of disease in that patient. But is it the right therapy? for every patient. Particular patients may benefit, others may not, and there's morbidity associated with a major operative procedure. While there's impact in progression-free and overall survival, it might not be the right answer for every patient. There's a minimally invasive or percutaneous method now for doing that type of regional therapy. This, too, has very impressive responses. CT scans of a patient with very bulky disease, these gray blobs are tumor throughout the liver, and here's you know, essentially, uh, a, almost a year later, this patient has almost complete resolution of all of those tumors from this approach. But is this the right approach for every patient? Yes, an impact in overall survival, but maybe not the right therapy for every patient. You heard about the newly approved systemic therapies, oral agents that impact these important pathways like the mTOR pathway, recently approved Evrolimus. This has an impact in progression-free survival. Or sunitinib, an agent that was just recently approved that has an impact. Do you give these together with each other, together with liver perfusion, after surgery, before surgery? How do you put these combinations together, and what's the most rational approach to staging therapy? Again, this has benefits not only to progression-free, but overall. Should every patient get sunitinib first before Everlimus or Everlimus first before sunitinib? 
no answers, no clear-cut answers, and ask five or six different experts, and you'll get three or four different answers. And that's just a few highlighted examples to show you. There's also the somatostatin analogs that you heard about. Standard chemotherapy, antiproliferative cytotoxic therapies, Temidor, Zolota, uh, Adriamycin, Taxotere, Cisplatin, all agents that have been used and brought to bear for the treatment of these tumors and what combinations to give. When do you give a systemic chemotherapy to a patient versus an oral mTOR inhibitor versus surgery or regional therapy? The treatment type, the sequencing of the treatment, follow-up for patients, what markers do you get? Serum markers, plasma markers, urine markers, imaging studies. Again, line up six experts, you may get six different answers. So what do you do? I mean, this is a situation that can be confusing. That's supposed to symbolize confusion, not change my diaper. What do you do? So in an effort to try to get our arms around this, folks at various centers across the country and abroad have tried to conceive of a way to bring many of those experts together in a system that actually looks at healthcare delivery with neuroendocrine tumors as the paradigm, but you can see how this could easily be expanded to other tumor types, and to say instead of having the patient travel around, put the patient in the center of the wheel and put the physicians around the wheel and turn the wheel in one place at one time for the patient to get a full spectrum of the types of treatments, to get the physicians in the same place so they can discuss for an individual patient the sequencing of therapies. For this particular patient, it may be that the balance of efficacy versus toxicity, the amount of disease, the pace of growth of their disease, tells us that we should start with something much less likely to cause harm but with some potential benefit to slow the growth of their tumor. Therefore, we're going to recommend this avenue to take as a team. We've talked about it. The expert for surgery weighed in. The expert for radiation weighed in. The nuclear medicine doc for PRT therapy weighed in. The interventional radiologist about taste therapy or RF ablation weighed in. The medical oncologist weighed in on the other options that were available. Our clinical trialist weighed in on the available clinical trials that we had and whether the patient was eligible. And together, we've come to this consensus recommendation for you to consider. Not that you have to follow, but for you to consider and maybe weigh against other opinions that you may get in the future. So this has actually been studied. This isn't just a back of the envelope or napkin idea that folks kind of throw together haphazardly, but it's actually been studied and a paper was published in the not too uh, distant past really setting the stage for a rationale for the multidisciplinary care in treating neuroendocrine tumors. And essentially, the overall goal of uh, what was put forward in this paper, and I agree with, is to improve the access to and the delivery of care and information, I would expand it to, for patients with this rare group of tumors to reduce morbidity and mortality, improve patient satisfaction and quality of life. That's critically important. You know, the reality is, for most cancers, that have gone beyond their local stage, that is a cancer that has metastasized or spread, the definition of cure, that is you're going to get rid of that cancer and it's never going to come back, is an elusive prospect. But that doesn't mean that the patient will die of that disease. And the idea that cure means life and anything less than cure means death is a fallacy. And we have to get that out of our thought process, both as patients and practitioners. Everybody dies. We haven't cured that yet. The human condition is such that we have an expiration date. We don't know what it is, which makes it interesting. But everybody will ultimately die and has an expiration date. So to think that you're going to die of a particular thing means that you're taking time away from the life that you have to lead. And so our goals in treating these diseases is to improve 
quality of life as much as it is what you would perceive as length of life. I mean, I often say to my patients and some of you in the audience who are my patients have heard me say this, my goal is to make certain you die in a parachute accident on your 80th birthday. You may still have liver mets, but you were parachuting to celebrate your 80th birthday and unfortunately your chute didn't open. You know, I can't control that. But what I can control is trying to help you live your life during that period of time with a team approach to sequencing the right therapies for you that we're not making you so sick in the pursuit of that unknown three extra years, four extra years that none of us know if we'll get, any of us will get. Enhanced coordination of services, very important. Worst thing in the world is you go to see the surgeon and you go to see the radiation oncologist and they tell you two completely different things. What do you do? You start to think, do they not like each other? You know, is this like, you know, does he owe him money? You know, is that why he's telling me this stuff? I mean, communication is, is really key. Provide efficient access to evidence-based treatment. Evidence-based treatment. I can't say that enough. There's a lot of opinion in medicine, and it's important. Opinion is important and judgment is critical because in the absence of absolute factually based, evidence-based data, opinion is critical. But when you have evidence-based data, either proving something to be effective or leading you to believe it's not, evidence-based data trumps opinion every day and twice on Sunday. And so that's real important. And reduce costs of care. You know, the idea of traveling from person to person to person to person, when instead you can go one place and see everybody, is a much more efficient paradigm for the healthcare system. And we're really struggling, as you heard, with challenging issues with healthcare dollars, that we have to be more efficient and reduce uh, cost where we can. So they defined a number of the different players that can be a part of this multidisciplinary team. And I'm not going to go over each of them. The list is here and it's in your book. But it's true. There's a lot of different opinions and perspectives that one needs to bring around the table, not just conversing about the individual patient, but thinking about what's the next best treatment that we may try to develop. Because each person brings a different experience set and a different set of skills to work together to sort of put us in the right direction. So at our own center, we have very similar strategy to what was published in that overview in terms of the people that sit around the table. We have surgeons that are focused on surgical therapies. Very critically important to Nurse Navigator, and actually our Nurse Navigator, Monique White's actually here today. Monique, if you can raise your hand. So Monique is here, and Monique really is the ambassador of our neuroendocrine tumor program. And any of you who have come to visit us know that. Monique is responsible for making certain that we don't get lost and the patient doesn't get lost. That all your information from any other therapies or diagnostic workups or clinicians that you visited with have all been brought together so we don't have to duplicate things. We don't have to get scans that you've already had or blood work that you've already had done. Sometimes things need to be repeated, but if they don't, why repeat them? And so all of that is sort of coordinated for when you come to see us, you maximize that experience when you've come for your visit. Endocrinology, very important. These are by their very nature endocrine tumors. And the tumors themselves and the therapies we sometimes offer can perturb the endocrine system. And having an endocrinologist involved, not for every patient, but for many patients is critically important. Radiology, having a dedicated radiologist that's used to seeing images for these tumors, that knows that FDG PET may not be that useful for a particular type of tumor, that perhaps it's better for us to get MRI in this setting as opposed to CT scan. We think it's very important for clinical research to be a part of what we're doing. We don't have all the answers yet, and if we're not asking questions, we're not making progress. And so clinical research is a cornerstone of what we do in a multidisciplinary program. And our study coordinator, Estella Forbes, who's also here, Estella, you can raise your hand, is an integral part of our team in terms of bringing the latest and greatest information about the clinical trials we have available to our tumor conference. We have a tumor conference every Thursday, which is our day for multidisciplinary day for neuroendocrine tumors 
years and we discuss all our available trials in the patients and whether the trial would match the patient. Gastroenterologists, very important. Medical oncology, a key cornerstone, and we're very fortunate to have two outstanding medical oncologists as part of our team. Radiation oncology sometimes plays an important role. Pathology, you know, these are rare tumors. Sometimes a tumor will be called one thing at one center and something else at another. And having a pathologist that's dedicated to neuroendocrine tumors and can sort that through and come up with the right grade, right stage, right diagnosis is critically important from the vantage point of sequencing therapies and potentially enrollment in clinical studies. Cancer genetics, key. Some neuroendocrine tumors are related to familial or inherited syndromes, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, SDHB or SDHD, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, von Hippel-Lindau, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So there are oftentimes clues as we see patients that perhaps this may be related to an inherited syndrome, which has implications for the rest of their family. So having a geneticist on the team focused on these diseases, very important. Nuclear medicine, PRRT therapy, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, other imaging modalities that are now coming online, very important to have their input. And certainly interventional radiology, both for diagnosis and for therapy, critically important. And so again in that paper, they sort of identified uh, the core members of the team and the uh, related members of the team may change depending on the type of tumor and the stage of the tumor. And so for early stage tumors, it may be a different core team that the patient will see as opposed to a patient with more advanced stage disease where the core team may change. So while we all may be thinking about your tumor and discussing the staging of therapy and the sequencing of therapy in our tumor conference, you may not need to see every member of the team every visit that you come. It depends a bit on who are going to be the core members for that. So what is the impact of this? Does this pulling together all of these resources in one place actually make a difference? Well, I believe it makes a big difference for the practitioners. We really enjoy practicing medicine like this. I'd much rather be sitting across a table from my medical oncology colleague who is passionate and interested in neuroendocrine tumors than sitting across the table from my surgical colleague who is passionate about hernia repair. I have very little in common with him, but I have a lot in common with my medical oncologist who is interested in neuroendocrine tumors. And so like thinking people like to think together. And so we are working together, the practitioners really enjoy this model. We think it's stimulating, we think it's efficient, we think it makes us all smarter and all better at what we do. And my feedback from the patients so far is they like it too. They like not having to go to six different places to get input within the same system. They like coming to one place. One-stop shopping is a convenient thing to do, especially when you leave with a plan and with information and you know your care team is all on the same page and all coordinated. But how about some objective measures? Well, there was a paper published fairly recently. The initial impact of a systematic multidisciplinary approach on the management of patients with gastropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And actually what they found, very interestingly, is in the time frame of when they launched their multidisciplinary clinic and began seeing patients in a multidisciplinary way, compared to the way they saw patients before, that they actually were seeing evidence of metastatic disease at the time of the initial diagnosis less frequently, probably because of earlier diagnosis and an awareness of the tumors and the diagnostic strategies to be able to employ. They also were seeing the use of novel targeted therapies and the measurement of important biomarkers increase as these group of practitioners would get together and discuss the best strategies for following these patients. The notion that you didn't need to follow them or that you didn't need to intervene on them sort of moved away when you got a bunch of experts together. Now these are just preliminary looks. And whether or not multidisciplinary care will ultimately impact on overall outcome for patients is still yet to be elucidated. But I would posit that it's certainly a better way to practice medicine for the practitioner, at least in my opinion, and a better experience for the patient, at least in the experience we've had since we opened the center. And so in conclusion, 
Gastropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are increasing in incidence, yet are still rare, and rare things should have eyes on them that have experience taking care of them. And a multidisciplinary approach improves patient experience and results in closer follow-up and perhaps less advanced disease at recurrence. And I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank my team, those that are here and those that aren't. And we're happy to uh, answer any questions at the appropriate time in the conference. Thank you. Thank you.